Hello students, I wanted to make a quick video to review enthalpy, entropy, and free energy. So we'll start with enthalpy. Enthalpy has the symbol H, and you can think of it as a measure of instability or potential energy. And in chemistry, this is related to bonds, like ionic and covalent bonds, and intermolecular forces. So if we break a bond, the separate pieces are less stable than the bonded pair, and so this requires energy, and it will always be endothermic to break a bond. And so we say then that our sign of delta H is positive. And because it's requiring energy, this is unfavorable. And then if we're forming a bond, it will release energy because the bonded pair is more stable than the separated atoms or molecules. And so we call this exothermic. And we say our delta H is negative, and this is favorable. And I say it's favorable because it's going to contribute to the spontaneity of that reaction. When we talk about enthalpy, we also often see reaction coordinate diagrams that look something like this, where we might have enthalpy plotted on the y-axis. And we have reactants over here on the left, an activated complex or transition state in the middle, and then products over on the right. And in this case, you can see that the reactants are less stable than the products. So our delta H would be negative, and this would release heat to the surroundings. Sometimes when we're talking about enthalpy, we say heat, like heat of reaction or heat of combustion. And that's a little bit of a misnomer. The reason we say that is because we can't measure enthalpy directly, but we can measure heat. And so we'll often use heat as a proxy. If we know how much heat left the system, then we can determine how much heat, how much energy or enthalpy the system lost in that process. And so heat is used as a sort of proxy to measure enthalpy. The second thing we'll want to talk about is entropy, which has a symbol S. And this can be thought of as a measure of disorder, although that's not a technical definition. Uh, it can also be thought of as the dispersal of energy in the system. So the more ways that it can be arranged, we call those microstates. The more microstates, means that you have more entropy in the system. This means if you have something that is constrained, such as atoms that are in a crystal lattice in a solid, that would have lower entropy. And if you had something that was less constrained, like gas molecules moving around, then that would have higher entropy. And for processes, it's favorable to have a positive delta S. That helps contribute to spontaneity. And the ways that we can increase entropy are going to be by heating the system up or raising the temperature. Gases will have more entropy than aqueous solutions liquids and solids. I put aqueous solutions above liquids just because it's a mixture and mixtures will have more entropy than pure substances. We have more entropy if we have more particles. So if we start with two molecules and we end up with seven molecules, then that would be an increase in entropy. And also if we have more complex molecules, if they're larger, if there are more ways for the atoms to rotate or vibrate within that molecule, then that will also increase the entropy. And then finally, we'll talk about free energy. Free energy has the symbol G. 
And there's two ways that we think about this. One is that it's the amount of energy from a process that's available to do work. That's why we call it free. And our equation helps clarify delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. So our free energy is the heat that gets released, for example, in an exothermic reaction, minus the energy that gets dispersed. Once it's dispersed, we can't use it to do work. And so it's no longer useful to us. The common way that we see this in Chem 106 is to talk about spontaneity. If we have delta G that's negative, then that means we have a spontaneous process. And if we have a positive delta G, that means it's non-spontaneous. And that's just another way of saying that the reverse reaction is spontaneous. For delta G, it's favorable to have a negative delta H, an exothermic reaction, and then a positive delta S where you have more microstates at the end than you do at the beginning. And in this case, if delta H is negative and delta S is positive, no matter the temperature, it will be spontaneous. And if you had the opposite, an endothermic reaction with a negative change in entropy, this would be non-spontaneous. But what if you have one thing that's helping you out, like a negative delta H, and one thing that's hurting you, like a negative delta S? Well, then it's going to depend on the temperature. If we come back to our equation, we're essentially comparing the magnitude of our delta H with the magnitude of our T delta S term. So in this case, delta H is helping us and delta S is hurting us. It's unfavorable to have that negative change in entropy. So this one will only be spontaneous at low temperatures. In other words, if we lower the temperature here, we minimize the impact of this delta S term on our free energy. In contrast, if we have a positive delta H and a positive delta S, our delta S is going to be helping us out, but our delta H is not. And so now this one will be spontaneous at high temperatures. In other words, if we raise the temperature here, we maximize the impact of this entropy term. And so then we can look at a reaction, and in these cases where they disagree, where the enthalpy might help us but entropy hurts us, or vice versa, we can say that this first reaction with our negative delta H and negative delta S is driven by enthalpy, and this second reaction where we have a positive delta H and a positive delta S would be driven by entropy. In other words, it's the entropy and not the enthalpy that's helping that reaction be spontaneous. So if you're given a reaction or a chemical process or even a physical process like a phase change, you should be able to predict by looking at the process whether the delta H should be positive or negative based on whether you're forming or breaking bonds. And you should be able to look at whether the delta S would be positive or negative based on how many particles you have and the states of matter and how complex the particles are in the reactants and in the products. And finally, if you can determine the signs of delta H and delta S, you should also be able to determine the sign of delta G, which tells you whether that reaction is spontaneous or not. Likewise, if you're given a description of a reaction, for example, that something happens spontaneously and it gets cold, then you know that delta H must be positive because it got cold and that delta G must be negative because it happened. And so what do you know about delta S? In that case, delta S has to be positive because it's the only way that your delta G could be negative. 
it would be like our last situation here in our little table. Okay, so that's a brief summary of enthalpy, entropy, and free energy. I hope that it is helpful. Thanks.